I'm Dr. Terrell Givens, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. The best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I just finished the biography of Eugene England called Stretching the Heavens by Dr. Terrell Givens. It's a fantastic book, and I highly recommend it. It's definitely, uh, I felt a real kinship to Eugene England, so uh, it's, it's a wonderful book. We're going to learn more about Eugene England's early life and uh, his, his trials to get into uh, teach at St. Olaf College in Minnesota. And uh, so I'm excited to talk to Tarot Givens about that. And by the way, I've got a book here by Tarot and Fiona Givens I'm going to give away. It's an autographed book, The God Who Weeps. And so um, please sign up to gospeltangents.com slash tarot if you're interested in a copy of this book. I'm going to do the drawing. Uh, so sign up by July 18th and you can be eligible to win an autographed copy of this book here. So sign up today. Now back to our conversation. Well, welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have one of the big thinkers at the Maxwell Institute. Could you go ahead and tell my audience who, who you are? My name is Terrell Givens. Uh, I was professor of literature and religion at the University of Richmond for a little over 30 years, and uh, I'm now a senior research fellow here at the Maxwell Institute. That's awesome. I always like to get people's background. You kind of introduced you a little, a little bit there. Where'd you get your bachelor's and master's and all that stuff? Well, I, I did my bachelor's work here at Brigham Young University in okay. comparative literature. And uh, then I thought I'd switch to intellectual history, so I went to Cornell and did all the graduate work in oh, intellectual so you're history. Oh, Ivy League too, huh? Well, I was for a while. <laughs> and uh, then I, and I, I guess I missed literature, and so I transferred back over to UNC Chapel Hill. Oh. And did uh, my degrees, master's, and PhD there in comparative literature. Did you ever get with Bart Ehrman or anything like that? I did not. Uh, I, he was just, uh, I, I think, on the route to his uh, contemporary notoriety at that at that point. <laughs> uh, but no, I didn't encounter him. So you get your doctorate in North Carolina, is right, that right? Right, right. Well, that's awesome. And then you, I think your first big book, at least the one I know about, was By the Hand of Mormon. A little before that, a few years before that, was uh, Viper on the Hearth. Okay. And uh, that was that came out in 1997. So that was my first book, which was a uh, it attempted to answer a couple of questions. Uh, mainly, what what is the is there a constant theme in the hostility and opposition that the Latter Day Saints have faced uh, from the 1830s to the present? And second of all. How do we explain the strange and weird kind of uh, manifestations of anti-Mormonism that appeared in the popular press in the 19th and early 20th centuries? Hmm. I remember my cousin, um, when he read By the Hand of Mormon, he was like, did a Mormon write this? I think, I think it was. I can't, you know, because to me that was your first big break onto the scene. Yeah, that, that was, it received a lot of national press, it, you know, got reviewed in the New York Times and yeah. London Review, and uh, yeah, I was pretty delighted that uh, some of the reviewers actually referred to me as a non-Latter-day Saint scholar, Oh, <laughs> and uh, I thought that that was uh, a kind of validation that uh, one can present with uh, balance mm -hmm. and, and, and fairness uh, the Latter-day Saint case from within the Latter-day Saint tradition. Yeah. You know, and I don't know whether to take that as a compliment, because a lot of times on Gospel Tangents, because we interview so many, so many different opinions, a lot of people are like, oh, Rick, you must be Community of Christ, or you must, you're not Mormon, or you're not LDS. I'm like, yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, in contemporary scholarship, there's a divergence of opinion as to whether or not one is, is obligated to establish one's... Uh, like prejudices or point of orientation. And it seems to me that the plane feels a little bit uneven. Uh, one very seldom reads a book in religious studies where it starts off by saying, well, I think the audience should know that I'm Episcopalian. Right. <laughs> yeah, they don't feel any obligation to, 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 to so indicate. And uh, so I'm not sure that Latter-day Saints need to either. <laughs> well, good. I always take it as a compliment that I, I must be uh, neutral enough if people can't tell if I'm LDS or right. not. So. Right. <laughs> Well, cool. Well, we're here to talk about your, your newest book. How many books have you written, by the way? I, I don't know. <laughs> you don't keep track? No, don't. I've got five here I got you to sign. I know that. <laughs> but uh, your latest book, Stretching the Heavens by Eugene England, 
Um, I know you actually turned that down. Uh, you mentioned that in the introduction. Tell us why you turned it down and why you decided to pick it up later. Well, I turned it down for a few reasons. Uh, Jean England died in 2001, and uh, it was very shortly thereafter that his, his widow, Charlotte, contacted me and asked if I'd be willing to write his, his biography. And uh, I hadn't met her, and I had met Jean passingly a couple of times. And at that point, there were a few reasons why I didn't want to uh, take on that task. One, um, it, it just seemed uh, like uh, an, an awkward kind of undertaking for somebody who, at that point, for one thing, I was very junior, right, in, in the profession. I was not of his generation. Uh, there were a lot of senior scholars in Latter-day Saint studies who knew him, uh, who knew the background, the era, and seemed to me would have been much better qualified. And it also seemed uh, awkward in the sense that uh, Jean England elicited really strong responses from everybody who knew or interacted with him, either pro or con. Okay. And uh, I wasn't sure that I wanted to engage in the controversies uh, at, that, at that point. And I, and I had other projects underway, and so I... I politely declined, and uh, so I think first one person, and then another, and then a third undertook to do the biography, and none of them uh, completed the task, and so around about, uh, I don't know, 2016, 2018, uh, she approached, Charlotte approached me again, and you know, <clears throat> maybe by that point in my life, I felt uh, enough of a kinship with him. Um, insofar as my life had come to parallel his in some fairly significant ways. Uh, I felt a deep affinity for his interpretations of Latter-day Saint theology. I, I shared some of his frustrations uh, that, uh, that the culture had not always lived up to its potential and its promise. And uh, I, I think I also felt myself to be a kind of insider-outsider. I'd always lived outside the, the Mormon corridor. Uh, I didn't associate with, didn't know, wasn't kind of in the mix of Latter-day Saint scholars, uh, really. And so I, I had, as I said, a kind of relationship to the church that was kind of inside but on the peripheries, and um, suddenly it felt like the right thing to do. And enough had transpired in the last decade or more that uh, I thought, I hoped at least, it was my hope, that the church speaking of it as, as a people, had arrived at a point where they would be open and receptive to the lessons that we could learn from Jean England's life and legacy. It was a very vexed and troubled life and legacy, and yet I, I thought that it had important lessons for us. And, you know, there was, there was it, it, at that period in church history when he was most active as a scholar, there was not a great openness to self-criticism or introspection, or asking hard questions. Is there now? And we've certainly moved in that direction. <laughs> I mean, the fact that we have, you know, the uncensored, unabridged Joseph Smith papers and the Gospel Topics essays and a... And a, and a, and a Some people would say the Gospel Topics essays are not uncensored. <laughs> well, uh, I guess having been involved in the process, I would have to acknowledge that they, 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 they did go through a great many layers of editorial <laughs> interventions. <laughs> so that's true. But at least they're right. They're an attempt to they're engage better. the tough, the tough questions, the sticky mm -hmm. wickets in our past, and the saints' history. Right, I think is is by far the most open and full, uh, unapologetic history that we're we've seen and are likely to see for a while. So yeah, I think I think we've uh, attained a certain degree of maturity in that regard. Well, cool. Yeah, I. I have to tell you, I'm, I hate to use the word liberal because I feel like I'm more of a moderate, but compared to the ultra-conservative culture here in Utah County especially, I, I feel liberal, I guess. And so I have a real kinship, even though I never met Eugene England, um, I just felt like, wow, he was, he was probably, tw would you say he was 20 years ahead of his time? Uh, yeah, maybe more. <laughs> Um, and yeah, it is unfortunate that we suffer from such a paucity of good language to describe the kind of approach to religion that Joseph Smith embodied, and that I think to some extent Gene England himself 
embodied. Uh, I, I like expansive as a word, maybe. I mean, Joseph Smith certainly would not have considered himself a conservative, right? <laughs> uh, in any way, shape, or form, right? Politically or, or theologically. Right. Um, and it's all, I think, post-1960s that, that because of social issues then at the forefront of American politics that the church has, has veered to a political right. Um, but Gene England himself hated that label, right? Right. Uh, there's, we have a personal memo he wrote to the faculty in which he described being hurt that he was labeled as a liberal. And uh, he was a paradox, right? Because in some ways he was as absolutely committed, faithful, unapologetically orthodox as anyone could be. Uh, and yet he was just much more expansive and open in his, in his thinking. What's ironic is that most of the pronouncements and writings that got him into hot water uh, today would be considered either mainstream or e even retrograde. Uh, so he certainly was a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of his feelings about a number of social and doctrinal issues. Mm -hmm. Well, let's jump into his life a little bit. I know at the beginning, one of the things that interested me was he was a weatherman. I think he was also yeah. a math major, and as a, I'm a math statistics guy, so I, I kind of glommed onto that. I thought that was pretty cool. Tell us more about his early life. Well, yeah, he was very good in the sciences and, and maths and thought that that's where he was going to go and had every intention of doing so. He says that it was his mission experience that changed his orientation because he... Is, the, the way he put it was something about the personal interaction, uh, being engaged with people at the human level, intimately, um, drew him to the humanities. And uh, then when he came back from his mission, he did a stint as a, as a, as a writer uh, for the, the uh, I think it was the, the newspaper. Didn't you say his father was disappointed that he His chose? father was very disappointed, never yeah. got over his disappointment. Um, <laughs> And part of that is because, uh, well, there's, there's not a lot of prestige in the humanities, and uh, it, neither is it a ladder to general authority status. <laughs> and there seem to be great indications that his father had those aspirations for him. And you don't see a lot of English teachers called as, as general authorities. And so um, I, I think that, yeah, his, and, and Gene felt the sting of his father's disappointment, I think, all of his life. But he, upon his return from his mission, he very quickly learned that he had a tremendous facility with writing, with language, and so was drawn to literature, and that's, that's uh, where he went in his work at Stanford, a PhD in literature. Okay. So, um, after his time at Stanford, I believe he went to Minnesota. Can you talk a little bit more about he, that? He went to Minnesota to St. Olaf, uh, a, a Lutheran college, and uh, he had he, right, he, his whole life was characterized by a kind of naive optimism, which I think is, is uh, commendable and, and a virtue. But he, he just thought, here's a, here's a college that believes in the integration of discipleship and scholarship. I'll fit right in. <laughs> um, and he found he didn't. Part of the problem was that he was very vocal in espousing uh, his Latter-day Saint commitments. And uh, he felt and felt that he had evidence that he rubbed some in the administration the wrong way because students actually some were converted to the church as a result of their connection interactions with with gene um and uh, so he did not secure tenure there at the university and to his great disappointment and so there was a period in the early 1970s where he didn't know where he was going to end up professionally why, why did they turn him down for tenure? Well, it's hard to say, uh, right? He himself had different theories. Uh, at times, he seemed to indicate that he thought his Mormonism was the problem. He later would say, for example, I was too liberal for BYU and too conservative for St. Olaf, and so I couldn't get a, make a life at either place. Uh, but there were also indications that at that point in time, and, and that's just a little prior to when I myself was entering the academy, uh, there was a big push to hire women and minorities, and he believed that as a white male he was at a disadvantage when a tenure position opened and others uh, competed for that slot. So he thought both the wrong moment in our uh, kind of the history of the academy as well as his religious affiliations. Hard to say which, maybe both were at work. 
I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Terrell Givens. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about Gene England's time at BYU and dialogue. And uh, so it was made known to him very uh, directly and explicitly that his affiliation with dialogue was a problem, an impediment to his hiring at BYU. And uh, so he did not secure a position here until he had divested himself of his role as an editor, although he continued to contribute over the years. Thanks for listening to Gospel Tangents. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe at patreon.com slash gospel tangents. You can hear the entire interviews there. Also, check out our new, improved, uh, user-friendly website at gospeltangents.com. We've made it much more user-friendly, so check that out. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got more of our great videos. Thanks again.